My name is Baron Scherer, and I'm principal artist of a local organization called Moving Image Alliance. It's an artist project that promotes legacy media use in contemporary art production. And I'm excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with director Bianca Steiger from the film Three Minutes, A Lengthening, which is premiering at this year's festival. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having me. So this is a pretty remarkable film. So I'm gonna kind of jump right in and I'm, I'm really curious about the origin of the project. Um, I'm wondering, did you see the, was it a case of stumbling across this original film on the Holocaust Museum website? Or did you happen to uh, uh, read the Glenn Kurtz book? I guess it was published six or eight years ago. Um, wh where would the genesis of the project? Well, the genesis, <coughs> sorry, was really, I was um, uh, scrolling through Facebook, as mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. And I stumbled upon a post uh, called Three Minutes in Poland, and that title intrigued me very much. So I clicked on it, read it. It was about um, this book about three minutes of footage shot in um, uh, 1938 in a small town in Poland. And you could then immediately see the, the footage you could see on the website of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Yes. And the footage is, is um, filmed in 1938 in a, a small uh, Jewish part of town. Um, the town is called Nashelsk. And um, you see all mostly children who really want to stay on camera and mm -hmm. smiling and waving. And it is in color, which of course also brings it um, very close to you immediately because, you know, that part of history um, is in our minds as if it happened in black and white. But here you saw that it really was also in color. And when I saw it for the first time, I really immediately had an idea yeah, three minutes is, is long. It's nice that we have these three minutes. Um, but couldn't we um, stay with these people a bit uh, longer? Keep it, keep this past in the present a bit um, longer. So that was really the starting point um, of the movie, which is now called Three Minutes of Lengthening. So I really try to make this three minutes last longer than three minutes. Okay. So uh, you, you concurrently, I guess you, you, you heard about the book, you read the book and said, I got to see the, the footage or was it happening at the same time? So you're excited about seeing it and then sort of. Yeah. Now I see you again. I lost you. Okay. Um, well then um, the Film Festival in Rotterdam, the International Film Festival in Rotterdam, asked me to make a video essay. I was sometimes working as a film critic at the time. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they wanted film critics, you try to make a video essay. And then I thought, well, yeah, video essay, video essay. This is what I really want to do. And then they uh, said, OK, uh, go ahead, uh, go and try. And then I. Um, uh, con contacted Glenn Kurtz, the writer of the book, and he's the grandson of the man David Kurtz, who, who filmed it all in 1938. And uh, Glenn made it possible that um, I got uh, the footage sent to the Netherlands so that we could uh, work with it. And then I we had a, a very little time, so then I managed to make a version that lasted, let's say, 25 minutes, but I still thought there's, we can extract more from this project. So then I took another uh, four or five years to make it into what it's now. It's uh, almost 70 minutes. Yeah. Incredible. Well, let me ask you this. Um, so this the short film was, was it like a draft of, of the longer work or you was, I mean, look, how are they inherently different besides the, the running? Um, well, let's say this is what I, 
we only had a few weeks then, so this is what I could come up with in that short uh, amount of time. I did interviews with Glenn Kurtz and we did all kinds of things with the footage already then. Mm -hmm. And most of the things I did then ended up being in the film that you see now. So okay. it was more of an extension than, than that it is a really um, different project. And so um, for this movie, um, your production, you said, took about five years. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess the way that, that you made the film, your production is post-production. Do you, is that something you agree with? I mean, it's post-production is the, what we would traditionally call production of the movie. And did you have a whole, whole in, in the four or five years, were you traveling to doing site research and uh, speaking? Yes, we did. We went to the, uh, the, the town in Poland, not so far from Warsaw. And uh, can we did sound recordings there. Mm -hmm. And I thought I also have to go to Treblinka, which is the death camp that most people that you see in the movie um, were murdered. Um, I went to Detroit because this is um, also an amazing part of the story. When the, the movie was up on the website of the Holocaust Museum, uh, a woman saw it and she recognized her grandfather as a 13 year old boy. And she showed the footage to her grandfather who is still alive today. He's 97 now, uh, Mr. Chandler. Mr. Chandler. And um, so he recognized himself as well in the movie and he um, uh, had a very good memory of, of, of the town and his life there. So this is also a lot of more mentioned in the in the book than I could ever put in the right. in the movie. But we did go to um, Detroit to interview him, and you hear him uh, speak about the footage um, in my film. Yeah. And so um, the research, and then I guess we go into this uh, uh, COVID crisis lockdown. Was that the the film is a 2021 film? Um, did you? Did that have any play into into to finishing the film, or, or did you have deadlines for festivals, a premiere, that sort um, of thing? Not really. There was, let's say, we. Well, I was also working on, on other projects at the same time, so mm -hmm. I wasn't continuously working on this. Right. But that was good because um, we would edit for a week and then have a break, and then we could see, oh, does this really work, or have a better mm -hmm. idea, this and this. So. We could slowly build it up and then it became more um, layered all the time, which right. was a good work pro uh, process for me. Yeah. Well, how do you categorize it? I mean, uh, it's, it's a hybrid film. Um, it's experimental, certainly. But I mean, the, it's essayistic. Uh, it's an experimental documentary. Like, do you have a niche, to, just like a sort of a catch-all term that you use to describe the genre? Yeah, well, let's say that the the, the idea that you only um, use that footage that exists and don't add any um, other uh, film material. Uh, we did add a lot of sound, of course, but not right. um, footage. Um, to my knowledge, I have not seen that done before. So I don't know if there's a term for that. You know, I, I mean, um, I, because I was thinking there's there's like an, an academic and maybe term 20, 30 years back uh, that people use um, archivology. Mm -hmm. It's sort of um, it kind of came to the forefront I guess in the early 90s when uh, a couple of filmmakers made some films based on newsreels there were mm -hmm. Italian newsreels kind of imperial colonial things that they appropriated and basically it's it's a term where you uh, let the original source material um, speak its own language you know you you're using cinema and and like a very cinematic way um, you, you you let the footage speak um and i think that's what you did uh it's pretty tremendous um you you the material 
contains uh, I, uh, everything that you need to sort of illustrate to, to tell your story. It, it, it is there. Um, I was trying to think, are there precedents for this? Not that I can think of. I mean, you know, in the late 60s, uh, Godard made a, a film called Letter to Jane, which was that it was a single still friend. image yeah. of Jane Fonda, but there were his ruminations. Um, you're, you're doing detective work and in, like investigatory work where you scan the frame and um, um, mysteries and remembrances are kind of unraveled and brought to the fore. Um, it's all, all really interesting to me. Um, what were the yes, so limitations? For, for me, they were, let's say, they were, let's say, it became kind of two strands that we follow in the movie. On the one hand, you have really the extension of the uh, the footage in a sometimes, as you will, uh, poetic way, let's say. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the other strand is to um, extract as much information from this um, uh, celluloid as possible. And then it, of course, also, in my uh, view, it becomes a kind of uh, film about film, of course. Uh, right. Is, let's exactly. say the third strand. That's why also, for me, it was very important to really show that view of, of, um, of the movie that you really see. What are we um, really looking at? The film is also a material thing right. that we tend to forget about, but it's made of the bones of cattle and all that kind of uh, mm -hmm. things. So that was also important to uh, dwell on. And so um, I, I took a look at Glenn's book and he, he there's a little passage in there where, where he said he made it after he delivered the film to Color Lab in, in Maryland, mm -hmm. that uh, he made a tentative narrative where he the, these home movies by um, uh, David Kurtz were were shot by pulling little cartridges in and out. He had a color cartridge and he had a black and white cartridge. And I guess he he made some sort of um, a determination. And you, you you're so into this footage, maybe you could kind of let me know like why is this in color and why is that in black and white? It might simply be this is of more import. So I use the new Kodachrome film stock and maybe, or maybe I need more light when we go inside. So use us faster black and white. Like what were, you have any uh, idea about uh, David's like editorial choices? Like why do you use this color? Why do you use that color? And then um, after Glenn's sort of tentative assembly or tentative narrative, as he called it, um, is that the proper, uh, that beautiful sequence at the beginning where it's as is uh, at the very beginning of the film, you run the three to three, three, 30 minutes. Well, we did at the beginning, we did it, let's say, as it was found. So right, first right. the color and then the black and white in the order that it's in uh -huh. the sets, let's say. And then at the end of the movie, we play the whole uh, uh, footage again, but then right. in the probable chronological order it was right uh, okay shuffling. fantastic i don't think um um david kurtz was um as glenn also says in the movie a very amateur filmmaker and he mm -hmm. only bought a camera when they went on this right. trip so he didn't know a lot about um how the camera he had how it worked so you also see sometimes his walking stick this is also for me very funny because when you watch it for the first time, apparently there are a lot of things you delete from your view. And then when someone says to you, there is a, a black stick going through the image again and again, then you see it. Because before that, your, your brain puts it to the side as non-important. So there were a lot of things, of course, also happening like that when you start to watch the footage, even now, still today, when I watch it again, I always myself see a detail that I haven't really consciously wow. seen because right. we are so um, programmed, let's say, to always, um, when there's a face in the image, we watch the face, we watch mm -hmm. the eyes. And But I'm not looking at your bookshelves, what's happening behind there. Right. I see, oh, yeah, there's a plant there. Oh, there's this and that, you know. Uh -huh. 
so your 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 um, how you view an image now they can you know they track that for for commercial uh, use they track where are people actually looking right. yeah. what is the point they focus on but um, so every film probably but certainly this film is much more rich than you um, would imagine still every time I watch it it yields something um, and kind of new which is amazing so how, how did you uh, how did you know what to look for I mean he he did you focus on things that he's not focusing on in the frames yes, yes. and so how, how do you even begin I mean that's like it's very sophisticated to structure the edit I mean you're trying to make a narrative a remembrance uh and you're like how, how do you investigate the image and and, and did, did you have like a topological map i mean i have no <laughs> clue how this this happened it's, it's very fascinating well, there's of course some ideas I, I had immediately i wanted to kind of to have it work as well as a kind of um memorial for these people for, for uh -huh. who um we don't know there's there's lists of names of course from who were all murdered from the village but it's very hard to put um the names to the to the faces so right. that the, their faces we had to use as a kind of right memorial. so ultimately so, i guess you you identified visually about 150 200 yes and then and then how many let's by say name? We, we asked for the the special effects guy I, I work with, I said, I want you to isolate every person that you possibly can mm -hmm. and, and give them, um, you know, make a portrait of them. Right. And he said, okay. And then we, I, I came back to see what he'd done for the first time. And it was very few people. I said, where is everyone? He said, yeah, but those people are not in focus and they're not sharp and it's very vague. I said, I don't care. I want, doesn't matter how fake they are, as long as it's recognizable as a person, that might be the only trace of a person um, that still exists. So we'll just go with it. And then you also, yeah, you could become very aware of the fragility of the of the film medium it's, itself. And also, if you um, think about it, when Clem found that the actual footage, it was almost beyond repair because it right. had lain in a closet in Florida, which is probably not the best climate to preserve very uh, humid. movies. So if he had uh, found it a month later, it might have been too late to restore it and it mm -hmm. would, we would never have been able to uh, to see it. So that is also for me a kind of like... It's pretty remarkable. And so, so yeah. the work of the special effects person was beyond, uh, I guess, your edit team. Yes. Yeah, yeah we had a, a special effect. Also, I wanted to, you know, try things. We had it made a digital cleanup. Uh -huh. um, we made it that it was made in a sort of kind of computerized uh, 3D model of the it's like machine learning. Software. I know yeah. there's like software now that it tries to yeah. give you the contrast that you need and the exactly. shading. Wow. But it was also into, we tried a few more, um, um, let's say, um, radical things, but um, the footage had also had some kind of mind of its own. Mm. So when we did too, when we deviated too much from the original, it was always like, nah, nah, this doesn't work. It was like it had a mind of its own. And that footage itself is, let's say, the, the stage, the most important thing. And we you always had the feeling you have to be sure to respect it and not right. do too freaky things with it. That just would not, every time me and my editor would try something, often it said no. No, this is no. It's like as if it had a mind of his own in a way. Yeah. Well, so I, maybe that's like uh, you had a limited palette. Mm -hmm. yes. That that yes. that kind of worked. Um. So, a couple of things uh, that I wanted to ask you about. Um, there's also a 
pretty remarkable sequence where you you you, you use sound you have a a, a a narrator and you have glenn and mm -hmm. is he being interviewed or yes reading i, I interviewed him way back in 2014 and then it's uh -huh. still used in this film and then you had a couple of polish actors that were that were reading oral histories can you can you yes. tell me a little more about that yes we had um there's a very um haunting um, a document that is kept in the uh, Ringelblum archives in Warsaw, okay. uh, Onek Shabbat, it's also called, and that describes the deportation of the Jews from this town, Nashelsk. And um, for me, it was very, it's a very long text, but for mm -hmm. me, it was very important um, to put it in the in in the movie. Then we had an image of the of the let's say the square where this took place. Right. So I said, okay, we just have um, a voice reading that um, text, and we zoom in deeper and deeper and deeper on the image of that square because also by by showing what you don't have, you you show what you do have. You know, this right. whole time the movie is very much about absences and presence and absence and presence in um, a lot of different ways. And then I find, then it turns out there was also this same um, uh, deportation is also hinted at in a German army document. So, so okay, we have to include um, that too. So there's two narratives that are not completely aligning uh, right. factually, but kind of. Um, so we both put them uh, in the film with the image, let's say, that, that you really know it happened on that square a year later than this footage was um, filmed. So that was for me very um, important to include as, um, as fully as possible. And, and in terms of like image coverage of that sequence, you did something very experimental, I would say, for anything that might be considered a documentary. Can you can you tell me a little bit more about that? I mean, yeah, we just did zoom ins on the on that same image, and it's just an image of cobblestones, let's say. Mm. When we start, we go in and in and in and more until it's unrecognizable as cobblestones and it becomes a kind of abstract um, um, yeah, abstract image of, of absence. Right. And of course, also our, our brains are programmed to make always make links between what you hear and what you see. So when mm -hmm. there's something said about mud, you will interpret that image as mud and that sort of things is for me very interesting how your uh, brain always tries to fill in um, right. what you see. And finally, I just a couple of more things, and then I'll, I want to. You mentioned towards the end that that there's no there's no memorial, you know, mm -hmm. in the Nichelle Square or, or the town area. Um, your your movie is a memorial, um, and I think it's. Um, I can't imagine. Actually, it's a pretty remarkable um, film. I don't want to say that that. I, I think it's a tremendous work um, that you based it or it, the starting point was the the, the book, but no, um, the, the, the old footage yeah. and the footage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you made a memorial, uh, you made a detective story. Um, it's, it's quite fascinating. And is there anything else that, that you want to say about the film? Yes, there was, um, about the memorial. Um, uh, very recently, there is a, on the edge of town was the Jewish cemetery, mm -hmm. and there all the, the the stones were taken away by the okay. Nazis. And um, but let's say the pathways are are still there, and a group of descendants has been um, cleaning this cemetery up for quite some years. 
And now um, they also retrieved some of the, they found back some of the windows of the synagogue that you see in the movie that was uh, demolished after the war. So they are now put near the cemetery and there's a, a little kind of um, memorial there now. There's a little text at the end of my movie, there's a little text mm -hmm. about that. And very recently after my movie was already finished, there is now also a kind of mural about the wow. button factory. So, and there's also actually now uh, a program started where uh, uh, children in Nashelsk are uh, learning more about um, the Jewish history of their town. So these are all very um, promising developments. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'm going to conclude the interview. I want to thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to director Bianca Steiger for the movie Three Minutes, a lengthening for joining us. Once again, thank you all to our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, and all you film lovers, as well as the Center for Advancement of Jewish Education, also known as CAJE, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for participating in this milestone 25th Miami Jewish Film Festival. Congratulations.